Uh, turn to Matthew 10, if you would, and I think we'll let this passage just use, use this passage to kind of springboard just into some, it might really appear random. See, my brain is like a music video, and you can get like partway into the thing, and you're like, where the heck, like what is that doing in there? But eventually it all kind of comes back to the chorus and makes sense, and it all wraps up nicely. So just, you've entered Dave's world. So just, you know, fair warning to everybody. But um, let's just pray for a moment. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would show yourself and that you would clear away things that would distract us from what you're trying to navigate. Thanks for your winsomeness and your humor and your ability to guide us. So Lord, I ask you come. Holy Spirit, Jesus promised us that you would lead us and guide us into truth. So we ask for that ministry now. We ask again and again for a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know your heart, that we might understand the musings and mysteries of the Godhead and that somehow you'd even remind us, I don't get this, how you do this, but I open myself and we open ourselves to this reality now that you would even remind us of the things that Jesus said. We didn't have a chance to hear those words and interact like those first 12 and 120 and those several hundred, Lord, but you promised us, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us and speak to us the words of Jesus. And so come and speak, we ask. Do something beyond just the simple words that I'm able to craft here. And God, even go beyond this written word. As much as we treasure it and value it, Lord, we know that if it's not mixed with faith, it really counts unto nothing. And so we don't worship this book, God. We worship you. We say, let your kingdom come. Align us with your heart, God. Let your kingdom come. Just ram us into this alternate reality called the kingdom of heaven. And take us beyond our own sight and our own natural senses, as wonderful and as engaged as they are in this whole process, Lord, we say, speak to our spirits now. Do something beyond just what we can craft with our own musings and thoughts and theories. We long for truth in the innermost parts, God. And we trust you to, to deliver the goods. We trust you to come. And so we thank you, Lord. Amen. To kind of find yourself in the slipstream of Jesus is a, is a pretty, it's kind of a frightening place. It's a fascinating place. Uh, it definitely is a place of adventure and life because the reality is this. We worship, I mean, this is kind of fresh in my mind because of last weekend. I mean, it should be fresh in my mind more than, more times than this, but it's really fresh because of Easter. God is alive. I mean, Jesus is alive. I think most of you might be aware that was actually one of the greetings of the earliest followers of Jesus Christ. He's alive. I mean, you saw, you know, you walked into Starbucks, you saw, you know, another follower of Christ. He's alive. Yeah, he's alive, dude. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, I mean, that was just, it was, it was so much in the understanding and the fabric of the earliest followers of Jesus that this whole thing was based on his aliveness. But it really sucks sometimes to worship someone who's alive. It's way easier to worship an idol. They don't move. They don't think. They don't engage in the meeting. They don't interact. You just you can get your sacrifice together. You know the protocol. You know what you have to do. You know how to just lay it out and burn the incense and do whatever you have to do. It's really easy. It's really easy to worship a concept. It's easier to worship a, a theology or some crafted religion but it is a completely different adventure to follow a God who is alive, who's thinking, feeling, engaging with us, 
It's a great mystery, and it's an awesome adventure, isn't it? And so Jesus really has opinions like right now. Like right in this moment, like right in this moment, the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son are, have thoughts. They have like, you know, suggestions about what's happening in this room. I mean, isn't that crazy? I mean, it's, it's really wild. And we've got to learn to walk into community where we can engage with that kind of dynamic with reverence, with appropriate fear, with all of those things, but we serve a living God. And the truth about Jesus is this, he's on the move. You know, I was a little disappointed, I have to be honest with you, in the Narnia movie. Uh, it was kind of, I guess, Lord of the Rings just put all of our expectations so high. The bar was set so high. I don't know, you probably really like the movie, but it, was a, it just fell a little short for me. But, but it's a great story, and I, and I thought they did a decent job of unpacking it. But don't you love that little phrase that C.S. Lewis crafted about Aslan? And if, you know, if, if you know, C.S. Lewis, you know, there's all kinds of dispute about it, but I think his heart was to, to do a, a type of Christ and kind of explain that whole thing. And it's, it's that little phrase in the book, you know, Aslan is on the move. I mean, he's really on the move. He doesn't stand still. And most times, as we're caught in his wake, he is moving to the pockets and places of society where injustice and marginalization are the most evident. It says in Isaiah 52, remember this morning we, we looked a little bit at Isaiah, it says this of the Messiah, who we now know Jesus is the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of all those messianic prophety, prophecies. And it says of him that he will be relentless in his pursuit of justice. It says in Isaiah 42 that the Messiah will not rest until justice is established in the nations. The concepts biblically of justice and righteousness are completely interchangeable. In a great twist of God ingenuity, in both the Hebrew language and the Greek language, the terms for righteousness and justice are completely intermeshed. They're two concepts that cannot be separated. You cannot be holy and not care for the poor. You cannot be righteous and not give your life to following Jesus into the breaking of the back of injustice in the nations. It's impossible. Righteousness and justice are interchangeable. Now, I come from a very strong conservative evangelical tradition, and I think in my history, I'm still trying to unravel this a little bit, most of us confuse justice with judgment. I think they're two different things because I'm learning more about God's heart. In fact, it's fascinating to me. There's this funny little verse in James. You might have heard, mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, you've got to read that verse in context because the judgment is prejudice and racism. It's not the eternal judgment. So that, that's, that'll mess up your whole interpretation of that verse if you pull it out of context. But I've heard so many people quote it this way. I've heard preachers preach this from the pulpit. Mercy triumphs over justice. Mercy and justice in the kingdom of heaven and in the heart of God work beautifully together. Justice in the kingdom of heaven is drawn from the well of mercy. So the good news is this. There's hope for the oppressor as well as the oppressed. There's freedom for the captive in the hills of Beverly Hills as much as the captive on the streets of Skid Row. I mean, that is the breadth and the scope of the kingdom of heaven. But as we wrestled with this morning and as we follow Jesus, where he begins ministry is on the fringes of society. We desperately want ministry to begin where we're most comfortable and where we have the most resource where we have the most money at our disposal, where we have the most talent, where we have the biggest facility, where we've got all these things. We think ministry begins and ends with these kinds of means. But my challenge to you is, because I think this is what Jesus is challenging me with as I wrestle with his teachings, and even more than wrestle with his teachings, I'm getting to know his heart, is 
moving out and advancing the kingdom of God is not based on those kinds of things. You can do kingdom ministry and have zero dollars in the bank. You can do kingdom ministry and be a millionaire. Isn't that good news? You can do kingdom ministry and just be in a little house church. You can do kingdom ministry and be in a mega church in Southern California with a gazillion dollars at your disposal. In all honesty, it doesn't really matter to God. It all comes down to this, faithfulness and obedience. Dare I even say it doesn't even matter if you're anointed or not. Just forget about that. The anointing's important. I don't really know what it is. I know it's important, though. But the truth is this. God says it's going to fall on all flesh. Wicked kings get anointed. Donkeys and jackasses get anointed. You know, it falls everywhere. How many, how many, how many of you have, you know, been sitting in your musings, dark, in the darkness of your room, you know, late at night, and you go, how did that guy, how did that guy have so much anointing when his life was such a mess? Or her? Have you ever, ever asked those questions? Because the anointing has nothing to do with you. It's all God's prerogative. He is sovereign. Do you remember that one? And his kingdom is advancing on the earth with or without us. So the good news is this. He invites us to partner. We look for all sorts of triggers and all kinds of mechanisms whether we can step into the ministry of the kingdom or not. The reality is the bottom line is just faithfulness and obedience so that when the anointing does fall on you, it won't kill you. Does that make sense? I've met so many people who are stressed out. Was that anointed, brother? You know, was that, I don't know. Some people really liked it, and there was actually a whole other group that thought it sucked. You know, I don't know. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, I'm longing for those moments. Like, please, get me, get me real. I mean I, I mean, I know there are those times. I've only tasted it a couple of times, and I want to see it more. You know, where there's that real, tangible, evident presence of God that invades the atmosphere, and for the most part, n- nobody can escape it. And that's a real reality, that's a biblical truth, but that's not the basis for our obedience or our motion. And Jesus is on the move now, and who taught him that? His father. In John chapter 5, he looks into the face of the criticizing Pharisees, And he says, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you. In fact, in John 5, it says, right after he said this, they wanted to kill him. My father is, do you remember this? Always at work. See, that didn't work for the Pharisaical theology. It was really hard to get big offerings if God was already working. It was really hard to keep the people in control and under their hierarchical system if God was at work without the priest. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's kind of scary stuff to talk about a little bit. He said, my father is always at work. I sat with a good theologian last year sometimes. Some of you know him. He's a good friend of Soul Survivor, a man named Don Williams. And I was crafting some stuff, and I just did this little phrase, because I just, I just heard it my whole life, and I kind of believed it was true. I've, I've, been to, I've got a theology degree and everything, but I, I just didn't really think this through, I guess. And you know, I wrote something like, you know, the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Don just put his hand on it. He said, that is absolute bunk. There is scads of historical evidence of the moving of God. And then I kind of thought about it. Yeah, why would God sit quiet for 400 years? Now, there was no clear clarion call prophetic voice like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah. And, oh, but God was at work. See, but that can really mess up your application of theology if you think God depends on you or how much you have or how much you bring to the table or how much you can offer or how hard you pray or how long you fast or how much money you give. Or, and those are all important components of following Christ, but we don't initiate. Does that make sense to you? And I hope this frees you. 
It would appear that the warning of Jesus about the yeast of the Pharisees is this very thing. If I just get that, if that athlete could just get saved, if that millionaire would just tithe, if I could just win the lottery, if, if we could just have that building, if, if, my, if my wife would just get on board, if my friends would just follow Jesus like I want to, if, if we just had that building down there, if we just had that skateboard park, if we could just get into that neighborhood, if we could just, you know, all the ifs and ifs and ifs. Truth is this, God is always at work. We need eyes to see it. And most of the time, my assumption is this, we don't see the moving of God because we don't position ourselves where he's at work. And I can guarantee you he's at work amongst the poor, the marginalized, and the broken because he is relentless in his mission to bring justice to the earth. Simply justice, we can define it this way, as it's it's partnered with righteousness. It's setting things right. Not by man's standards. This isn't about human rights. This isn't about getting what I want. This is about let your kingdom come. Repent. The kingdom is upon you. The Greek for repent is metanoia. Change your way of thinking. You're perceiving reality in a wrong way. It's not unlike the red pill, the blue pill. I'm serious. There's an alternate reality called the kingdom of God. Its values are different. The way it operates is different. Its definitions of success are different. The way that that you move and the way that you find security here are entirely different than any reality you've ever known. Align yourself with this kingdom. Let the kingdom come. Let justice come. Let righteousness reign. They're all interchangeable concepts biblically, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is this kind of making sense? And so all of a sudden now, walking into the ministry of Jesus has a whole different perception. The bottom line is this. The agenda of Jesus is justice. To set things right to align all things with the glory and character of God because he will not give his glory to anyone else or anything else. And so we say, let your kingdom come. Jesus said, wherever you go, you say this, the kingdom is near. The kingdom is upon you. The very last verse of the book of Acts, Paul is in house arrest. People are coming from all over the known world to hear his instruction. He tells them stories about Jesus, and he teaches about the kingdom. Salvation, sozo, is attached to the Hebrew understanding of shalom. This isn't about ticking off a card. This isn't about kneeling at the front of a church. This isn't about some decision that you make so that your life will get better. This is about aligning yourself with the kingdom of God. To completely abandon all your agendas for the agenda of Jesus. And his agenda is justice. And there is no clear presentation of the gospel without addressing the issues of justice. Some, remember this from earlier. One thing you lack. But if that one piece is missing... The whole message goes sideways because without the poor at the heart of the gospel, the gospel becomes all about me. You ever find that happen? Bless me, bless me, help me, give to me. Why are you not breaking through, God? I've prayed and prayed. I've fasted, I've fasted. I've given, I've given, I've given. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Bring it, Lord. Bring it, Lord. Bring it, Lord. Because we've stepped into a place of mercy and love, it's very easy to disorient ourselves and make it about us. But it's not about us. It really isn't. 
and not in some heavy religious way. It's about the kingdom of heaven. And it's about following Jesus. And he moves to the furthest reaches of society because it is that that is at the center of the kingdom. That which is in the margins of our culture is at the center of the kingdom of God. Who's going to believe this message? Who's going to want to believe this report? If I'm really honest with myself, not me. I need God's help. But the truth is, if I can trust him, and that's the bottom line issue, isn't it? If I can trust him and abandon my whole life and all the dreams and agendas that I carry before him, if I can step into that place of self-disclosure and complete intimacy and honesty before God, I will find life out the other side. But if I try to hold on to my life, what does Jesus tell us? I'll lose it. Let the kingdom come. And so Jesus summoned his 12 disciples. He gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. The context is this. Jesus has just looked out over the masses. He's looked out over hundreds and thousands of people. Matthew 9 tells us he's moved from village to village to village to village and he's prayed for every sick person he's encountered and every single one of them has been healed. Do you know how exhausting that is? I mean, that will wipe you out. Jesus, fully clothed in humanity and in the mysteries of God, fully retaining his godness, but still walking as a man, he's tired, he's cranky, you know, he's, he's, he hasn't had enough sleep. His arm is aching from stretching out over sick person after sick person after sick person after sick person. And he comes up over the hill and he looks out and all he can see is more. When will it end? There's just more poor, more sick, more abused, more issues of injustice. Because see, at the heart of injustice is just one very simple thing. It's the abuse of power. Whether it's a pastor to a church, a doctor to a patient, a policeman to a person, a president to his nation, a king over his country, a father to his daughter, a friend to a friend, someone with wealth towards someone who doesn't have wealth, wherever there is power, the abuse of that power results in injustice. And isn't it fascinating that the one who held all power and all authority, as Philippians 2 tells us, emptied himself. We just had more power. If the glory would just fall, if I could just be more anointed, if we could just stretch out our hands and the laser beam come off the end of it and the sick just heal just like that. You know, I just, with one glance, demons are flying out of people. Oh, that would be the real deal. Have you ever found yourself praying that? Now, I really want that to happen. I think that'll be so cool. But the truth of it is this. That's not ministry necessarily. There'll be many people that encounter Jesus at the end of time. They go, hey, Jesus, it's me. I healed the sick. I raised the dead. I cast out demons in your name. Hey, it's me. Party on. I'm here. Can you just, can you kind of step a little closer? I can't quite see your face. Just kind of, can you come in the light? Yeah, but Jesus. I healed the sick. I raised the dead. I cast out demons in your name. Just, just a little closer. Yeah, but Jesus. I, I don't know you. Now, the way I was raised, that verse was used to teach me to be afraid of charismatic churches. 
That's not the point of this verse at all. It took me a long time to get over that. Really, seriously. It has nothing to do with charismatics versus conservatives. It has to do with the heart. There's a guy named Simon the Sorcerer who was fascinated in the book of Acts with the power of healing that Peter and John and others were displaying as they moved about doing kingdom ministry. He thought he could buy it. There were some men called the sons of Sceva who were Jewish priests and who were invoking the name of Jesus Christ and were actually casting demons out of people. They didn't know God. How does Jesus recognize us? Dad, Father, there's one. Call him over to your right side. I, rec I recognize him. Looking across this massive crowd of humanity at the end of time, he catches someone's eye. I've seen you before. We know each other. Come over here. I was sick. And you held me. And you cleansed my wounds. And you prayed for me. Oh, there's another one. Father, there, I see him. Bring him over here. Well, how do you know him, son? Well, I was naked. And he clothed. Isn't this fascinating? We think he's going to recognize us by the power and the accolades and the, and the money and the ministries that we've built and the, the things that we've you know, navigated and the awesome things that we've done for God as we've stepped into our intergalactic apostolic calling to the nations. Now, there might be one of those. I don't know. But I can guarantee you, if you follow Jesus to this place of life, See, because Jesus said earlier as well in Matthew 9, he said, if you want to understand me, take this advice. And he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6, Go and learn what this means, as Keith has been encouraging us. You can't get it in your head. You can't get it through knowledge. You can't just get it through teaching. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Wow, what is that? I thought this was about sacrificing everything. I live in Orange County, and I've been so blessed, and I have so much wealth. Just out of the goodness of my heart, and because I've become a follower of Christ, I will, I will give to the poor slob down in air, airplane park. And I will, you know, I will move. And I, you know, I'll even take a year out of my life and go serve, you know, in the Peace Corps. I'll move, you know, to a, to a village somewhere. And I will, you, you, you know, see, it still becomes all about us, doesn't it? Do you have the courage to fall on the rock and have it break you? Lest he fall on you and you be crushed. Can we turn, not in some heavy obligation or out of some religious duty, but as we've encountered the kingdom of heaven and the grace of God, we abandon ourselves to this place of trust and we go, I consider everything on the earth as dung next to what it means to follow the living Jesus Christ to wherever he would take me. There is no clear presentation of the gospel if it's missing that kind of encounter with the poor and the broken and the marginalized of society. It's an unclear message. The rich need to see that. The poor need to feel it. There's no gospel without this peace. It is the good news. The poor are fed. The sick are healed. Who were the sick in the time of Jesus? The outcasts. See, the Pharisees had developed a very elaborate theology They'd done lots of dancing and twisting to get here. But if you were chronically ill, even as a Jewish person, you were forbidden entrance into the temple. 
a chronically ill Jew was not even allowed to go into the court of the Gentiles. They were barred from the presence of God because they believed God had cursed you. And anyone who carried the curse of God wasn't allowed into community or they'd bring the curse of God on everybody. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Because we, we kind of do a little bit of teaching like that sometimes ourselves. It was pharisaical heresy. Why do you think Jesus was so aggravated when he found himself in the temple and so many people were barred from entrance? But it was a double whammy because the Romans as well had a very clear teaching that those who were chronically ill in society were the cursed of the gods. So the lame, the blind, the lepers, the chronically ill, multiple sclerosis, paralysis, AIDS, any kind of communicable or long-term disease you were barred from the temple of God. Where did Jesus go? Who did he minister to the most? The sick. This wasn't about healing a headache and house group. I mean, that's a great place to start. Don't get me wrong. That's really helpful stuff. But it was about justice. It was about going to the most low of the most low. Do you know, we have a young man in our vineyard in Kathmandu, Nepal, who leads worship from a wheelchair. And it's, it's anathema to the church in Nepal. They're embarrassed. It's this mixture of some, in my opinion, some misunderstanding of the teaching of the scriptures in regards to healing. That if you really had it all this side of heaven, you should be 100% for sure healed. And the other side of it is it blends really well with the Hindu caste system because the sick are at the, they're not even in the caste. They're like way off the bottom. Just walk through a third world nation. Who are the beggars? The sick. The sick were the outcasts in the time of Christ. And he, there is more references to Jesus healing the sick than any other reference in the scriptures. In his ministry. It was at the very heart. But this was an issue of justice. It was about shattering bad theology. And it was about breaking the back of an economic system that had pushed them to the very bottom of society. And they were trampled on. Only good enough to be beggars on the street. That's where Jesus went first. It's where he spent most of his time. We have a hard time grasping this. We've got hospitals. We've sanitized sickness. We've made it, you know, a little bit touchable. In the time of Christ, and the truth is this, for 90% of the world, maybe even a higher percentage than that, it's still the reality. And we'll make them come to crusades so that we can throw their crutches away and do great DVD shows and bring, take big offerings for it. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm just going to be really careful here because I... Only Jesus can judge the whole picture, right? I, everybody's got a role to play, and I don't know, but I tell you, let me just give you Nepal, for example. It took me three solid years of building into relationship for the Christians to finally tell me what they thought. I met more than one person who sold everything to facilitate crusades for some pretty big name Western preachers took their, their daughter's dowries. And the Western man goes home with all the offerings, proclaiming the blessing of God. And in the wake of ministry, shattered. The poor coming, I'll tell you, all you need is some white skin and a guitar, and I guarantee you, you can draw a cloud of multiple thousands in the third world. It is not hard, and I don't demean any ministries that, you know, I've done big meetings over there, but the, the, we are so consumed with ourselves and so insecure in our own ministries. We're so desperate to prove something to God, things that we don't have to prove to him at all. We have his unmerited love and favor. 
that we'll talk ourselves into these huge ministries and these massive meetings, and there's lots of good that goes on. Please understand me. But I'll tell you, I've walked with seasoned leaders in the third world. I've sat in the home of a young man in Kathmandu. His wife and him started bawling and crying because I just went to their house. I said, the man of God doesn't come to our home. We have a squatty potty and there's rats running across the floor. We always meet them at the hotel. I said, what are you talking about? No one ever comes like here. This man was in the process at that time, this is almost 10 years ago now, of being courted by all major mission ministries because he was very well educated, was the only believer from his village at that time. He was really articulate and had a lot of favor in Nepali society. Everyone he wanted them to, to be his, you know, their man on, on, the, on that part of the world, in the Himalayan mountains. You know, sat with a bunch of people at this conference, just went into the, you know, food tent and just started eating rice with my hands and, you know, getting all mucky and dirty and, you know, getting diarrhea and all kinds of stuff. But I'll tell you this, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, they would just bawl and weep. They go, the man of God doesn't eat with us. He has an entourage. In fact, he's got bodyguards. We don't understand it, but, but, but we thought that was the way it was supposed to be. Walked into the hills of, of northeast India. Old, wizened, seasoned follower of Jesus Christ has walked for days and days and days and days to be with us. Comes out of the backwoods of Bhutan. Completely closed nation. Spent prison time. His house, as he's meeting with us, is being burned to the ground by angry Buddhist priests. And he comes in a three-piece suit. Now, I'm not against three-piece suits. But I was against this suit when I heard the story. His family went without food for over a week so that he could afford the suit because a man of God wears the suit. And I must look like I'm being blessed. I must step into this place. I want to tell you something. That is injustice. It's an abuse of power. We must understand the heart of Jesus Christ. Being equal with God did not consider that equality something to be grasped. But he came and he emptied himself of title, of power, of position, of wealth, of resource, of the angelic host. And he came in simplicity and I know some people disagree with this, but I have wrestled with this. I have so desperately tried the scriptures, tried to make the scriptures say that Jesus stepped into a position of wealth on the earth. I, I, I can't find it and have integrity with the text. He came not just amongst the poor, but he became poor. not out of some religious obligation or to start some religious order, but because the heart of the matter is the heart, not the power or the platform or the ministry or the wealth. And God very well might shower down those things. Paul said in Philippians 4, he gets to the end of his life and he says, i got to tell you something. It's been a long journey. But I've learned a secret, and I want to tell it to you. I'm dying. I want to tell you something. Be content. Whether you have a lot or you have a little, contentment is the key. Because in the lean times, you'll bless God. In the times of abundance, you'll give it all away. That's freedom. That is freedom. Just final thoughts. So he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. And here's the context of the verse that we just sung in the song. Freely you've received, Freely you give. What if I give them 20 bucks and they blow it on drugs? 
freely you've received, freely you give. But what if I live in my house and they steal all my stuff? Freely you've received, freely you give. But what if they take that thing and they don't give it back? Freely you've received, freely give. Yeah, but this is just a wise investment of our money. Freely you've received, freely give. It's actually quite simple, isn't it? What if Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit thought like us? Board meeting. Call the meeting to order. All right, Jesus, you pulled the short straw. We're going to save the world. You're going to have to die. But let's think this through. You're going to have to empty yourself of all power, title, position. You're going to clothe yourself with human flesh. You're going to actually carry this body for all eternity. Do you understand? Isn't that wild? That is one of the great mysteries of the gospel. It's going to cost you a lot. There's going to come this moment where the very fabric of the universe is just going to be barely holding itself together as the Father forsakes the Son and the Son turns away his, his head in agony. My God, why have you forsaken me? The, you know, the thunder will roll. The darkness will just cover the earth. The whole universe is almost going to blow apart at the seams. You will descend to the very pit and bowel of hell itself and wrestle the keys of life and death from the grip of Lucifer. You will rise again. This is going to be, this is going to be horrific. And the reality is you don't have to do it to be God. We don't even have to do this to beat up Satan. That is one of the greatest errors of theology ever. The cross was not about beating up Satan as an end in itself. Is God God? Kind of makes sense. God could have dealt with Satan any way he wanted, right? I mean, he wouldn't even have to look. It's over. Why the cross? For the joy set before him. What was the joy? His bride. You and me. It's going to cost us everything, boys. Well, let's just, let's kind of take an assessment here. Hmm. Most of the human race was going to reject this. And even those that take advantage of the mercy we're about to show, they're going to abuse it, like over and over. We're just going to be the forgiveness machine. I mean, it's going to be like day after day, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord. That's going to get quite nauseating. They're going to like... They're going to they're gonna like abuse our name. We're going to like, you know, people are going to hate us. They're going to talk about us on talk shows. The news is going to misrepresent us because of the, the, the foolishness of some of those that will claim to be our followers and even those who really are. You know, it's going to be this long journey of sanctification and maturity. And you know what? It's not a very good investment. It's not a wise use of our resources. It's a waste. What if God thought like that? Aren't you glad he doesn't? Freely you've received, freely give. Verse 9. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts. Another translation would say it this way. Leave your money at home. That doesn't make sense. 
How are we going to help? How are we going to advance the kingdom? Don't you know there's marketplace apostles now? Don't, don't you know that, that we're, the, the church is going to be the head, not the tail? And we're not going to take over society. Now, I'm all for that. Believe me. We're, we're hoping to develop a compound in L.A. We're going to run businesses, all that kind of stuff. But that's not when our ministry begins. And ministry really isn't even about that. Isn't this like one of the craziest pieces of advice Jesus ever gave? Leave your money belt at home. Because the truth is this, if you carry it with you, you just have to give it away. You know, didn't Peter and John know that? They're on their way to the temple. Someone cries out for help. Hey, give me a few bucks. Well, silver and gold I don't have on me. Doesn't mean they didn't have any money. Doesn't mean they didn't have any wealth. But they did not base their ministry on the amount of material resource they had. Ministry was not based and defined as successful or not successful by how much money was in the bank. It was defined by the heart of faithfulness and the ability to turn and go, but you know what? Whatever God has given to me. And at this moment, it's a prayer. For some of you this afternoon, it was a sandwich. Others of you, it was just some paint that went on somebody's face or you held a little child in your arms. But you took the time and you embraced the courage to go and learn mercy and not sacrifice. This wasn't necessarily just about taking a Saturday off. This, wasn't, this was no great sacrifice. And the point is this. When we capture the heart of Jesus, it's not about sacrifice at all. It's about love. And no greater love has anyone than this, Jesus said in John 15, than you lay down your life for a friend. What is that? That doesn't sound right. Isn't it the greatest love to lay down your life for an enemy? Lay down your life for the obnoxious neighbor. Lay down your life for the person that inconveniences you and the beggar. You know, every time you turn, try to turn off the freeway, down at that corner, that same guy's there again. I'll lay down my life for that slob. All of a sudden, it doesn't sound so impressive, does it? What was one of the nicknames of Jesus about friendship? Do you remember? The friend of sinners. Now, again, we sort of contextualize that in our modern society, and we hang out with sinners all the time. Let me tell you, in the time of Jesus, you didn't. You isolated yourself from them. They were cursed. They were anathema. And to be called the friend of the prostitute, the friend of the beggar, you understand the sinners, the sick would fall fully in the category of sinners because they were cursed of God. Remember how confused the disciples were? Well, who sinned? His dad, his mom? Where did he screw up? Where was the hole in his faith? Where did it bleed out? What did he do wrong? Why is he sick? It was a very strong theology that the Pharisees had purported. Like I said earlier, they weren't the sick. Jewish sick were not allowed in the court of the Gentiles. So to be called their friend was like, it was, it was so revolutionary. It was just, I mean, we can't even comprehend how far out of the box Jesus was. Can you become a friend of the poor? Or are they an outreach? Can you become a friend of the marginalized? Or are they your ministry project so that God will like you more? Can you become a friend of the broken? Or are you just helping them out of the goodness of your heart? It's a really different journey. But like we said this morning, the good news is this. With us, that's impossible. And we'll juke and jive and create all sorts of doctrines and theologies and things to get us out of the thing. <laughs> but if we trust Jesus with God, even this is possible. Who, several years ago, years ago, could have walked into any government office in the world and had an audience without an appointment? could have showed up at any business, 
could have found her way anywhere. A little wrinkled up Albanian woman who sold herself and spent her life on the streets of Calcutta. It's an upside down kingdom. Now that just didn't happen in a day. See, she started where Jesus starts, in my opinion. Maybe let's put it in the words of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. We want to get everything added unto us and then we'll go after the kingdom once we get everything in order. Does that make sense? You know, when I get trained enough, when I get anointed enough, when I get enough money, when I get my education, when I get my wife, when I get that trip to Hawaii, Lord, just let me get that in. And then, you know, I can just get this. It kind of sounds like one of the parables of Jesus. You know, you say, hey, just come, come hang out and eat. You know, well, I got to do this and I got to do that. And so where does Jesus end up again? He ends up with the poor and the broken. Because as James has instructed us, they are the ones who are rich in faith. People go, why, why is the power falling in South America? Why is the gospel spreading in Africa? Why is it not happening in North America? We need more faith. We need to tear down the principalities. We need bigger stadium meetings. We need this, we need that. Could it simply be what we read this morning in Matthew chapter 10? It's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom. Could it really be that simple? Leave your money belt at home. Don't take a bag. Don't take two coats. Why would he say don't take two? Because he's already instructed us what? If you have two coats, you have to give one away. Well, I'm serious. Don't take two sandals. Why? Don't take two pairs of shoes because if you see someone without shoes, you've got to give them that extra pair of shoes. And the point of Jesus almost seems to be this. That actually could get in the way of the power encounter that you're actually longing for. Because you'll be relying on material things to advance ministry instead of the power and grace of God. Freely you've received, freely you give. The worker is worthy of his support. God will look after you, but I don't know if we really believe it. One of the hardest things our family did was a couple years ago when our accountant just about killed us. But we thought we'd try an experiment. We'd give away more than we had given before beyond a tithe and we wouldn't take any tax receipts. That was really hard. I learned a lot about my heart. I learned a lot about my motivations. As Bono said at the National Prayer Breakfast at the beginning of this year, this is not about charity. This is about justice. Let the kingdom come. Let the kingdom come. Let the kingdom come. Another quote of Mother Teresa, I'm going to butcher it, but it's sort of like, you know, just, just do one at a time or it was something like that. I mean, lots of people have said that over the years, but we just, we don't like that. It just doesn't feel impressive enough. It's not, you know, it just, it doesn't make the internet look good. It doesn't, you know, my blog sucks when I'm just like spending time with one person. Another fascinating thing in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, search everywhere until you find one person that you can connect with and then stay there. We've made ministry about let's blitz as many homes as we can. You know, let's just like, you know, we got the tracked machine gun. You know, let's just get it out there. You know, let's accumulate as many, as many people at the altar call as possible. You know, just ram the names full. Let's just, you know, and there's some, I mean, when God moves and it's organic and it's, it's Holy Spirit initiated, it's awesome. I've seen, I've seen hundreds of people respond to things at the same time. But the advice of Jesus is stay put, build relationship, because those are the things that last. And we are building into an eternal kingdom 
not into a statistical report so that we can raise more money for next year. Let the kingdom come. Freely you've received, freely you give. Freely you've received, freely you give. Don't be afraid of the poor. Do not be afraid. I think one of the greatest lies of the enemy is fear. But it's Phariseeism. If you touch them, you'll get touched. If you touch the cursed, you'll get cursed. If you let them take too much, you'll end up just like them. See, we have a, we have a great problem in America and Canada. We've been founded by people that were fleeing poverty and oppression. And there's great blessing in that. I'm so thankful. But it can really do damage on the inside of who we are as we try to follow Jesus. And we turn God into this being that is there to bless us. One of my good friends, his parents were born and raised in India. They came over to Canada very uh, later in life as a married couple. Their children were born in the city of Winnipeg. It's a good friend of mine, Joe Epen. He runs our addict recovery house in Winnipeg. Got his university degree, was up and coming. He's just one of these great kids. And he's about to, he just, got, he just got ruined for the inner city. Like, just blasted. So he cut back on his hours. He just took a substitute teaching position because he, he needed to work. He needed to, like, pay his bills and stuff. But he was a single guy, so he could kind of balance it. And he moved into this recovery house. I mean, sniffers and just this whole thing. His father is just a great Christian man, you know, just, just loves the Lord They're in a very strong church. But he was so angry. Do you think I left India and worked my fingers to the bone to get us a house in the suburbs? I crawled myself up facing prejudice and racism I worked in the kitchens. I worked in the sweat houses. I moved my way up into management. I've now got my own little company for you, son. I don't have an education. You do. What are you doing throwing this all away for just a few sniffers on the street? It's hard, isn't it? But dad, Jesus is taking me there. Yeah, but I gave up everything so you could have an education. So that you could have an inheritance. So that we could have a nice house in the suburbs. So that you could find a nice girl and give me some great grandchildren. You know, we could just hang out. We could barbecue in the backyard. And we could watch the football games together. And, all that. and those are not bad things. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus said, watch it. In the big picture, I'm bringing peace. In your home, I'm bringing a war. Father will turn against daughter, daughter against mother, brother against brother. This is going to be one of the hardest wrestles ever. And look at that royalty check every quarter. Is this for my kids? Is this for me? Is this for what? Is this my retirement? Is it, I don't know, God. It never gets easier, let me tell you. I don't have a retirement plan. That's not a great heroic thing. I just don't. I can't figure it out yet. I can't, I honestly, I can't figure it out yet because I keep running into people who need more than I do. My kids are in the LA public school system. People think we're crazy. But you know what? I sit with my son sometimes late at night and just start talking about the people we've met and the things that he's seen and done. I know he's learned more about God 
and about the heart of justice and mercy than he could have got in any university. And he probably will go to university. I don't know. It's not pitting one thing against another. It's about seeking the kingdom first. They're very hard things. I'm so sorry I have to invite you into this, like, into this mess. But there is a God who loves us. With us, this is impossible. But with God, it really is possible. You can actually give and not get a tax break. You can do it. No, you can do it. I'm telling you. You can do it. You can abandon your future into the hands of God. You can really do it. With God, it's possible. You can spend your life in some shithole in another country of the world with the most broken and the most shattered of society. You can do it. With God, it's possible. And never get any recognition. Never get anything back but an eternal reward that will last forever as you bask in the glory of God himself. And you stand in that day when every tear will be wiped away. When all sorrow, all pain, all injustice will be banished forever and ever by the King of kings and the Lord of lords himself. And there is a crown of justice, it says in 2 Timothy 3, for all who long for the appearing of Christ. Most translations have translated a crown of righteousness. And we've so messed that up and made it about rules and regulations and striving to attain to some holiness that has nothing to do with holiness at all. But just with selfishness and religiosity. And the king calls us into his kingdom. And there is a crown of righteousness. A crown of justice that will be placed on the head of everyone who longs for the appearing of Jesus Christ. When we focus on this world, when we focus on ourselves, when the poor are just an outreach and not our friends, when we move to the margins of the kingdom of heaven and call it the center of the church, and we miss the marginalized of society that are at the heart of the kingdom of God, you won't long for his appearing. There'll be no need to. Well, Jesus, just, just could you hold off 10 more years? I, I, haven't, I haven't got enough done yet. Jesus, can you just hold back your return? I haven't got married yet. Can you hold back your return? You know, I really want to get my doctorate. Can you hold back your return? Now, I really want to get that house that I've been dreaming about forever. Can you, can you hold back your return, Jesus? Yeah, I, just, I, just, I just got to get that boat. Or I've got to travel. I haven't, I haven't backpacked through Europe yet, Lord. Can, can you just wait? I don't mean to be overly dramatic or overly heavy, but do you see what that does to us? And I tell you, spend time amongst the poor and you will long for the return of Christ. Say, Jesus, come. End this, Lord. But he waits a day. He waits a thousand years. He waits a thousand years. He waits a day. Time isn't the issue. He's not willing that any should perish. But that all come to repentance. So I'll wait, Lord. But while I'm waiting, I'm going to touch the least. Because if I've touched the least, I've touched you. Let the kingdom come. Holy Spirit, just move now.